Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, fingers crossed, no love for Arthur, and it's only been 50 years. It's all next. It's Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it starts now. Hitting Hard is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We ask you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Get the latest episodes of Hitting Hard as soon as they become available. Check us out on the SiriusXM app as well and give me a follow on my personal Twitter page at JMCH316. So NBA writer for Yahoo Sports, Jake Fisher, put an article out, and I've spoken to Jake before. I've had him on my radio show, and he's not just some knucklehead or anything like that. I mean, he's obviously kind of, you know, an inside guy, and he's got his sources and all this good kind of stuff. But I have had him on the show before, and I've enjoyed talking to him. Well, he put out uh, an article uh, yesterday, I believe, that this was, and he started talking about the idea of, one is he talked about the idea of Pascal Siakam, maybe being, you know, in the mix for the Atlanta Hawks, but there's been less optimism that a deal can get done. But here's the thing that I want to focus in on that he says in his article, okay? Elsewhere with the Hawks, there continues to be, and this is a direct quote, elsewhere with the Hawks, there continues to be optimism among league personnel familiar with the situation that Atlanta will come to terms on a contract extension for all-star God DeJounte Murray. Now, Murray also put out this cryptic tweet the other day. I think it was yesterday or day before or whatever like that. And he talked about his loyalty and all this good stuff. I mean, didn't really get into much detail, but it was a, an idea of loyalty. And loyalty doesn't come easier, whatever the crypt. But again, it was a cryptic tweet talking about the idea of his loyalty to the Atlanta Hawks. Now, I have speculated that, look, if you're the Hawks, there's no reason to not give DeJounte Murray an offer as a contract extension before he gets to free agency. Again, worst case scenario is that he becomes a free agent, which a lot of people think he's going to be anyway, because frankly, he can make a lot more money. Frankly, he can get a lot more pay becoming a free agent and drive his potential price up. but. The risk of that is, is that if he does get traded at the deadline where, again, if the Hawks can't work out a deal or this, any other, and he wants to stay in Atlanta, you know, does he roll the dice and bet on himself that the Hawks are going to give him a big time contract? Now, I don't think DeJounte Murray is going to be a max player when all is said and done. I think he's going to be a well-paid player. I think he's going to make north of what even John Collins made at $25 million per year because that's the trend nowadays, right? Again. You saw Fred Van Vliet that got like $40 million. I mean, it's crazy what these guys are getting, but that's the marketplace. And it's not about what you're worth. It's about what the marketplace is. And Murray is really one of the biggest bargains in the entirety of the NBA. He's a $17 million a year guy. He was 17 million and some change last year. He's 17 to 18 million again this year. So if you don't think you can get a deal done, again, I've said, I still think that you try to do everything you can to get Murray to sign a contract extension this summer. And then you go forward and okay, now we've got our kind of core set because again, I I really want to see what Quinn Snyder over the course of the year can do with a DeJounte Murray and a Trey young together. When those guys played well, the Hawks played well again, more than any of the other duos. And yeah, I know last year, you know, not this past season, but a couple of years ago or whatever it was now that Clint Capella and Trey Young combined for the most uh, field goal makes and stuff like that, right? He'd be Lob City and, you know, Capella would close it out. And then obviously Trey Young scoring at will. I get all that. But when Trey Young and DeJounte Murray coexist and you see it together, when they work together, This team is, I don't want to say unbeatable, but they're almost unbeatable. And and more than any other combination, 
that you can put on the floor, having Trey and DeJounte, and obviously with both of those guys, you can split them up if need to, right? They both can handle the basketball. They both can run the point position. Or if you get them working together, and certainly we want to see Trey do more off-ball stuff, running around, running off screens, seeing about setting himself up for more off-ball, because that was the plan. And even Nate McMillan talked about that as the plan. But I want to see all of this come together. And fingers crossed that this gets done. Because I do think, and and I'll say it, look, I think DeJounte Murray was the MVP of this club last year. Some people would say Trey Young. Some people would say Clint Capella. I think DeJounte Murray was the MVP of this club. I think he made more winning basketball plays than anybody on this roster. That includes Trey Young because it's not just his offense. It's a steal here and a rebound here and an intercepted pass here and this here and that here. It's a mid-range jumper to give them you know, a lead that was insurmountable. Whatever. Whatever. Offense, defense. He does a lot of different things on the court. And obviously, you know, I mean, again, he's a probably top half guard defensively. He certainly may be the best defensive player that the Hawks have. And and I will say, frankly, that I thought his defense let the Hawks down at times in the playoffs last year. I thought his defense didn't match up to what his reputation was. And I think he's been a second team all defensive player but it didn't live up to some of that. And I'll fully admit that. I, and I love DeJounte Murray, and I think he can be a good piece. And, and I, I said this literally from last year opening night against the Rockets. Okay? Go back and listen in time to what I said right after that Rockets game the next day on the podcast was that when you watched him play, just even in that first game, when you watched him play, he looked like a guy who had played for Greg Popovich. He looked like a guy who was well-coached. He looked like a guy who had a high basketball IQ. All of the things that Greg Popovich would have instilled in him and been looking for, he had that. He had that element. Not that he was going out scoring 50 a night. Not that he was necessarily, you know, Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen is this ultimate lockdown defender, but he made winning basketball plays all the time hit a free throw late, a rebound here, a steal here, an intercepted pass there, a mid-range floater from 14, 15, 16 feet. Whatever it was, he made winning basketball plays. And again, this is good news, and I don't necessarily doubt that Jake has some inside sources that tell him all of this. You know, the Siakam thing is a whole nother issue. I Again, I like Siakam. I'd love to see him in Atlanta. I'm just not sure how realistic it is to make a deal like that. And you're certainly going to be way in the luxury tax when all is said and done, because if you're staring down the gun barrel of signing DeJounte Murray, he's going to be a 25 to $30 million player himself. He ain't going to play for fish heads and rice. And and he's not giving the Hawks some hometown discount. He may want to be here and play for this team and partner up with Trey, but he ain't going to give him a, a, you know, a, a kickback on his deal. This is his chance to get paid. And he's probably, you know, maybe about half of what he would get on the open marketplace considering the contracts that we're seeing in today's NBA. But if they can get this deal done, now that gives you a blueprint about how to move forward with this roster. It gives you a blueprint about who kind of, you know, can stay, who kind of maybe is expendable. Because again, we've heard DeJounte Murray's name brought up in trade after trade after trade after trade getting him a contract extension. And with the new CBA, it makes it a little bit better because you can offer a higher percentage than you have been able to offer in years past. Still not free agent money when you hit the open marketplace, but it's better than what it's been. You know, instead of like, I think it was last year was 120%. I think the number is 140 to 150 now in the new CBA. So you can offer him more money than you could in the past as an extension, but fingers crossed, let's hope that this works itself out. And certainly this could be good news for the Atlanta Hawks, because I think he's a key piece and I would love to see DeJounte Murray be here long-term in Atlanta. All right. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. And as you know, FanDuel is America's number one sports, but you can take your first swing at betting on major league baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times 
your first bet in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. You get just bet $20 and you could land $200 in bonus bets, whether you win or whether you lose. That's $200 you can spend on betting everything from money lines to over-unders to who you think is going to be getting the first home run. And it's all on the app, safe, secure, super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. So there's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up today. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N to get up to $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose when you bet $20 on your first bet. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. FanDuel is the official partner of Major League Baseball. So CBS, and we talked about this before with Pro Football Focus. Pro Football Focus had their top 10 coaches in the NFL. And I thought, okay, I I don't think Arthur Smith is maybe in the top 10 just yet, but I don't think he's far away. He's probably in that maybe 13 to 16 kind of range, right? Maybe 14, 15, somewhere in that aspect, okay? Well, CBS put out their list of the top head coaches in the NFL, and this was by Cody Benjamin, okay? And boy, he does not give any love to Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith came in at number 29, 29 for Arthur Smith. The only guys that were worse than him, Josh McDaniels at number 30, Jonathan Gannon for the Cardinals at number 31, Matt Eberflus for the Chicago Bears, and that was it. Now, some of the guys ahead of him, Todd Bowles. Anything exciting about Todd Bowles? Dennis Allen. Anything exciting about Dennis Allen? Robert Saleh. Okay. D'Amico Ryans, who's in his first year as a head coach, and he's got one of the worst rosters in the NFL. Shane Steichen. First year coach, Brandon Staley, Dan Campbell. I'm not a big fan of Ron Rivera at 21, but okay. I mean, at least he's been to a Super Bowl. The one that gets me is Kevin Stefanski, who's the Browns head coach, who's a disaster. And I speak from real truthfulness and experience. He's a disaster as a head coach. Can't coach his way out of a paperback. He's got all kinds of talent. He's got a Super Bowl caliber roster. Deshaun Watson, Nick Chubb, Miles Garrett, this guy, that guy, beep, bada, boop, bop, bop. And he can't do nothing with them. So, I again, when I look at this and I look at some of the Gavones that are at head coach, you mean to tell me Arthur Smith and the way that he has put this roster in motion over the last two years with duct tape, Band-Aids, uh, twisty ties, um, you know, those little plastic things that your your bread or your buns, you know, get the little twist thing to, to keep them sealed up. He's done, he's he's done it with nothing. And now look at Kevin Stefanski, he's got a Super Bowl ready roster. He's got he's got all pro after all pro. And his offensive line is full of pro bowlers. Arthur's a much better coach than what they give him credit for. And I understand the Falcons have gone. 20 losses the last two years. I get that. But there's no way you could watch Arthur Smith implement his offensive philosophy with the pieces he's had and not be impressed by the fact that one of the big reasons we've even won 14 games is because of Arthur Smith's ingenuity on creating an offense and an identity. And and as my friend Bo Bach would always say, he's got a playing personality about him. They, they have a playing personality for the Atlanta Falcons. They have an identity. They know what they want to do. They don't try too often to get way out of their comfort zone. Sometimes they do. So And, I, and I, I'm not even going to knock that when you try to get out of your comfort zone. Because, again, in the NFL, you've got to have some creativity. But when it backfires, he's got something he can lean on, something he can rely on. And he's a big reason why 
they've won even the 14 games that they have the last two years. He's a big reason why that even starting Marcus Mariota and a rookie in Desmond Ritter, that they didn't take a step back in wins. It was flat, but that's better than regressing. And there's a reason why last year Vegas had them at a over-under of four and a half, and they have them now at an over-under of eight and a half. You know, that's a pretty significant number to go one year to the next and double your win total. You know, again, I understand that four and a half isn't very impressive, but there's a lot of people who thought they wouldn't even get to four and a half last year, and they won seven. Now the expectation moves up in year three, and we'll see, obviously, if he can compete for the division, if they can have a winning record, and I'll give Dan Campbell credit that he's helped turn that Lions team around. They were the laughing stock of the NFL just a few years ago. And then they drafted Aiden Hutchinson. Well, they drafted Panay Sewell. Then they drafted Aiden Hutchinson. I'm trying to think, where do those two guys play? Oh, yeah, it's the line of scrimmage, offensive and defensive lines of scrimmage. I'm sorry. I, I, I just was I was dreaming that we were drafting linemen that play on both sides of the football. And I'm sorry. Anyway, I get distracted there. But again, their franchise has turned around. And Arthur's turning this franchise around. And look, I don't know if they're the betting favorite to win the NFC South. I don't think that they really are. You know, again, it could be the Saints, could be the Panthers. Some people think the Bucks. I don't know why, but whatever. But Arthur Smith's got this thing pointing in the right direction. As compared to what? The Cardinals? As compared to the, the Chicago Bears? As compared to the Texans? Again, the Browns have all pro after all pro in the roster, and they don't have a coach who can't get out of his own way. He's one of the big reasons why they stink. He's he's one of the more direct reasons why they're not a very good football team because of him. And they've got all the talent in the world. What makes him a better coach than Arthur Smith, who's done this thing with chewing gum, tobacco juice, and you know some little twisty ties? Come on, folks. I mean, let's be realistic here about this. Let, let's have some perspective. I'm not telling you that he's one of the best coach. I'm not telling you he's Belichick or Andy Reid, or even John Harbaugh, or even, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Kyle Shanahan. All he's done is, you know, all kinds of winning. Offense coordinator, now head coach. I'll give you all of that. Nick Sirianni's turned the Eagles into a Super Bowl runner-up. And, and he didn't do it in 20 years. He's done it in a couple of years. I'll give all that. But to say that Arthur Smith's down at the very bottom of the barrel? Come on, man. I mean, let's have some perspective about all of this. Arthur Smith is a big reason why the Falcons are projected to be a much better team this year than they were last year. And now he's got pieces and parts that he can play with. Let's see what he can do. Because again, now there's going to be more pressure on him. This team has to win. They have to be better in the red zone. They have to be a better, more balanced offense. There's a lot of things that still have to elevate themselves up for this Falcons football team. But there's no way anybody can deny that this franchise is headed in the right direction. And Arthur is a big reason why at the home that they are turning things around. All right. As you listen in to John uh, hitting hard with John Chuckery as your first listen, be sure to go in and leave us a comment on whatever podcast platform that you listen on, that you're an everyday listener to the program. I like to call them our everyday, as we like to say. So leave us a comment. Let us know that you're an everyday listener five days a week into the program. We do thank you so much for being a part of our community and obviously listen in all five days of the week and let us know that you are an everydayer to the program. So it's only been 50 years. Let's go way back in time. And I was even born. Uh, this is, I mean, again, this is like ancient times. It's like BC times, right? 1973 for the Atlanta Braves. You know what happened in 1973 for the Atlanta Braves? They weren't a very good baseball team. They were 76, 85, and believe it or not, won. <laughs> Somehow they had a tie uh, in everything. But one of the things that they did offensively is Davey Johnson playing second base had 43 homers. Daryl Evans playing third base had 41 homers. Henry Aaron playing in left field had 40 homers. 
That was the only time in Braves history that they've had three 40 homer guys in the same season. Well, guess what? Let's fast forward. Let's do the time thing. Like Wayne's World. Okay. Fast forward 50 years in time. And guess where the Braves are now? Matt Olson is on pace to hit 55 homers. That would be a franchise record, as Andrew Jones has the franchise record of 51 homers. Ozzie Albies, believe it or not, is on pace for 41 homers right now. He's got 22 right now. That puts him on pace for 40 homers. And Ronnie is on pace for just a whisker. He's on pace for 39 and a half home runs. So let's round that up to 40 homers. And the Braves could do something that has only been done once in franchise history. And it's been, believe it or not, 50 years since it happened that they had three 40 homer hitters. And wouldn't it be interesting that if Ozzie Albies becomes one of those guys who hits 40 homers for this team as the last time it was on a team, Davey Johnson, the second baseman, hit 40 homers. Wouldn't it be ironic? I don't know if that's an Alanis Morissette song or not, but wouldn't it be ironic if Ozzie also is a 40 home run hitter? And obviously, look, there are still guys that could find themselves having big second halves. I mean, again, Austin Riley is a guy who really hasn't caught fire and put this team on his back, but he could still be a 40 homer guy. Believe it or not, Marcelo Zuna is on pace for 33 homers right now. That's crazy to think, again, that he's a 30 you know, on pace to be a 30 home run hitter, but he's on pace for that. Sean Murphy's on pace to be between 25 and 30 homers. So they're putting up big numbers. This could be the first time in 50 years that the Braves end up with three 40 home run hitters. We know how good that they've been, right? They're on pace. And again, I said this the other day, they're, they are, they're on track to be the best offensive club that this franchise has ever seen. Now think about that with all of the guys that have been in this offense over the decades, generation, what have you, you know, the chippers and the Sheffields and the Javis and the Henry Aaron's and, you know, Davey Johnson and Daryl Evans and Dusty Baker and Dale Murphy and Bob Horner, right? We can go through the whole list and, and the Andres Galarragas and the Mark Teixeiras, even guys that were only here for a very short amount of time. This is on track to be the best offensive club the Braves have ever fielded. Runs scored, potentially 340 home run hitters. You know, Ronnie's running wild on the bases. He's on track to steal 65, 70 bases when all of a sudden it's ridiculous how good he is right now. And he's on track to be the MVP of the league. But the Braves have a shot that after 50 years, they might have their next group of 340 home run hitters. And look, all of this is, it's very realistic. And who knows? I mean, again, if Riley catches fire, if Marcelo Zuna catches fire, like there are all kinds of guys that still, you look in this lineup that they could catch fire. And Olsen, again, is on pace to hit the 55 home runs, and that would be a franchise record. Again, I talked about this yesterday or the day before. It's remarkable that I, I never thought I'd see an offense that was as good as that 2003 team. But you look at all of the different individual numbers that this team is looking at just smashing. And I know it's a different era of baseball. You know, offense is at a premium. Home run hitting is at a premium strikeouts, you know, nobody cares about that kind of stuff. But still, this is a team that offensively can do everything to it. And now this might be another feather in their cap. It would be fun to think about that 50 years from the last time that it was done. And I'm I'm that old. I mean, I'm again, I was alive in 1973. The very I was very young, but I still was alive in 1973. But it's interesting to think about the fact that this team could replicate something 50 years in the making where they have three 40 home run hitters. And let me tell you, okay, while that Braves team in 1973 only finished 76 and 85, brother, that ain't going to be the case for this Atlanta Braves team. If they don't win at least 100 games, I, I will be shocked 
if they don't win at least 100 games, it will be because either they just had everybody hurt on their roster or they decided to just call up all their Gwinnett guys and just let everybody take part of the season off. This team is outstanding, and it's all led by their offense. And when you look at the individual numbers that these guys are putting up, the Olsons and the Rileys and the Ozzies and the Michael Harris's and the Ronald Acuna Juniors and the Marcelo Zunas and the Sean Murphys, all of these guys are contributing. Orlando Arcia, you go up and down the roster. The Eddie Rosario, Eddie Rosario is on track to be 25 homers, 80 RBI. Who would have thought that at the start of the year? And by the way, he's made some nice catches in left field. He's not been a disaster out in left field defensively. But hopefully, you know, again, we have fun with some of these numbers and we have fun projecting some of these things. Let's see if the Braves, for the first time in 50 years, can find themselves with 340 home run hitters in this lineup. That would be some monster numbers at the end of the day. All right, well, thank you so much for making Hit and Hard with John Chuck for your first listen. Be sure to go in and leave us a comment as to whatever podcast platform that you're listening on. Let us know that you're an everyday listener to the program. So we like to call them our everydayers. We do thank you so much for being a part of our community, but let us know that you're an everyday listener five days a week into the program. And we do thank you so much for being a part of our community. We ask you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. You can get the latest episodes of Hitting Hard as soon as they become available. Also, check us out on the SiriusXM app and give me a follow on my personal Twitter page at JMCH316. Back with you tomorrow. This has been Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. 